Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. Firstly, apologies for the croakiness in my voice which still hasn't gone. Still got the flu. It's winter. It's Europe. What can I say? 1973 was an especially bad year for the Soviet Union's flag carrier Aeroflot. Seriously, on Russian Wikipedia there is an entire page dedicated to all the accidents and incidents that the airline had in 1973, and there were days where multiple accidents occurred. In fact, throughout 1973, 113 accidents and incidents occurred aboard Aeroflot. That's almost one every three days in one year. But in all fairness, not all of these were Aeroflot's fault, and a couple of these were hijackings. One was Aeroflot Flight 2420, and another was Aeroflot Flight 99. We're going to look at both of these in this video. The Tupolev Tu-104 was a game changer for Soviet aviation, built between 1956 and 1960. And from 1956 to 1958, it was the only jetliner operating in the world. Operated by Aeroflot in Czechoslovakia's CSA, it flew from 1956 until 1981 with 201 built. However, it was unreliable, heavy, and very unstable, as well as unsafe, with 37 or 18 percent written off and a combined 1,140 fatalities. The TU-104B number USSR 42505 was built in 1960 and based in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. On the 23rd of April 1973, it was doing the routine Leningrad to Moscow Shermatov leg, a flight time of 1 hour and 34 minutes or 634 kilometers. Pretty bog standard, but this is Soviet Aeroflot. On board were Captain Chayaslav Mikhailovich Yanchikov, co pilot Vladimir Michalovich Kirovlin, navigator Nikolai Fedrogovich Shirakov, flight mechanic. Bikenti Grifovich Gryasnov and flight attendants Lydia Eremina and Marina Kokreva. Yanchenko was born on the 19th of March 1938 in Ufa in modern Russia. Previously flying the AN-2, he then started flying the IL-14 before flying the TU-154. The crew were operating their third flight of the day, having already done a turnaround from Leningrad to Moscow. To all extents and purposes, this was a routine flight with 51 passengers aboard. The flight took off from Shoseyanaya Airport in St. Petersburg at 2.25pm, bound for Shematyov in Moscow. However, one passenger, Ivan Biduk, seated in row 13, had slightly different ideas. He approached Emremina and asked to be moved to the first row, which she obliged with. A few minutes later, he pressed the call button with Emmermina coming down, and he gave her a letter, which he demanded was given to the pilots. By this stage, the TU-104 was at 7,800 meters, with a flight attendant calling request going to the cockpit. Yanchenko asked Kryasnov to go out and see what the issue was. He went into the cabin, returning with Biduk's letter, which was sealed in an envelope and written on four sheets of paper. The letter asked the crew to divert the flight to Stockholm, Sweden, and noted that he had two kilograms of explosives, which he had allegedly bought from mines. And Budayuk wasn't bluffing, he did indeed have two kilograms of explosives. Yanchenko pressed a distress signal and informed Leningrad Shoshenyaya Airport that they would be returning back to the airport. Since Aeroflot Flight 244 on the 15th of October 1950, which saw the father and son duo Pranas Brazenskars and Algridas Brazenskars successfully hijack an Antonov AN24, with the plane arriving in Trabzon, Turkey, as a successful defection to the west, the crew of Soviet aircraft have been armed to prevent hijackings. By the way, we did an earlier video on that hijacking, so don't forget to check that video out. Yanchenko gave Sherikov his gun and told him to go to the cockpit door and try to calm Bidiuk down. The bomb was in fact a reverse mechanism which would be detonated by a button. Sherikov tried to calm him down and said that in they were indeed heading for Sweden. Meanwhile, air traffic control gave the Tupolev Tu-104 permission to land. And damn the pilots did it smartly, keeping up a facade that they were heading to Sweden. 
The plane glided and only at an altitude of 150 meters on a landing course of 310 degrees did they release the landing gear. Realizing he was duped, Budiuk let off his bomb. However, it wasn't really that powerful and it only pierced the cabin partition and tore off the front door, damaging the hydraulic system. The nose lowered but somehow the pilots kept flying and landed at Shoseyaya airport in Leningrad with the fuselage nose down and sliding down the concrete, guiding it and driving it to the side security strip. With smoke arising in the bow, passengers ran to the rail door but were pushed back by Emremina and Kokreva due to a 7 meter drop and directed to the front exit with airport emergency services extinguishing the fire. Two people died instantly in the explosion. Graysenov and Bidiuk. The crew became Soviet propaganda pieces on the 6th of June 1973 and Chenko was awarded the Order of Lenin and the Gold Star of Hero of the Soviet Union. Krivulin and Shirkov were awarded the Order of the Red Banner. Ermina and Kokreva were both awarded the Order of the Red Star with Graysenov posthumously awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union and the Order of Lenin. At 85, Yanchenko is still alive. He continued being based in St. Petersburg and working for Aeroflot before becoming a traffic safety engineer at what is now Pulkov Airport in St. Petersburg from 1997 until 2009. He still lives in St. Petersburg. Grysonov is buried at the Preobraskeskynoye Cemetery, the cemetery in memory of the victims of the 9th of January in St. Petersburg. A public park in Avia Godork in St. Petersburg is named after him, and on the 9th of August 2019, a bust remembering him was unveiled in the park. The tuple of TU-104 was written off. This wasn't the only Aeroflot hijacking of 1973. The Yak-40 is a regional Soviet jet built from 1967 until 1981 with 1,011 produced. It's a small plane only able to hold 32 passengers with two pilots and one flight mechanic and a range of 1,800 kilometers. The Yak-40 serial number 9120618 serial 18 slash zero sucks was built at the Sagatov Aviation Plant in modern day Russia, which operated from 1931 to 2012. It was transferred to the Ministry of Civil Aviation and assigned the tail number CCC P87607, and on the 23rd of July 1973 was sent to the Civil Administration of the Central Regions and flew for Aeroflot based in Bryansk in the Bryansk region. Aeroflot Flight 19 was operating from Baikovo Airport in Moscow to Bryansk Airport, a distance of just 50 minutes. There were no flight attendants aboard. The pilot was Ivan Kashin. Kashin was born in Sakagava in 1937 and had worked for Aeroflot since 1954. The co-pilot was Stanislav Talpekin and the flight mechanic was Nikolai Nikitin. There were only 28 passengers aboard. Ten minutes before arrival in Bryansk, four male passengers got up. Viktor Ramanov, Vladimir Zalnin, age 16, Pyotr Bondarev and Alexander Nikiforov, having taken two hunting rifles and a sawn-off shotgun as well as knives aboard the plane, which they hid in the luggage compartment and took the passengers hostage at gunpoint and tried to enter the cockpit. With no flight attendants, the pilots and mechanic had no idea what was happening in the cabin. Kashin asked Nikitin to go into the cabin and find out what was happening. He then shouted that they were subject to an attempted hijacking and slammed the cockpit door shut. He then tried to take the gun off Romanov, but was wounded. Gaponeko tried to take the gun off Bondagev, but lost his balance and was wounded. Kashin sent a distress signal to Bryansk airport, but it was thought to be false. Why the airport thought this, we will never know. The hijackers then broke the lock to the cockpit door, entered the cockpit, and ordered for the crew to return to Moscow. The crew relented and returned to Moscow. On approach to Vunokovo airport, the crew reported that the hijackers wanted $1.5 million US, promising to save the lives of the hostages and provide information about other hijackings. Chairman of the KGB Yuri Andropov and Minister of Internal Affairs Nikolai Shelokov arrived at Vunokovo airport and took charge of the operation. Nikitin and Gaponeko were both wounded and were released upon arrival of the aircraft in Moscow. 
Moscow. The four hijackers then set their conditions. Firstly, in exchange for the refueling of the aircraft with the plane low on fuel, they would accept $750,000 and release half the passengers with the Yak-40 then to fly on to Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, where they would get the other $750,000, have another refueling, the remaining passengers released, and then they would head to Sweden and ultimately out of the Iron Curtain as defectors. However, defection in the Soviet Union wasn't quite that easy, and it was decided to launch an assault on the Yak-40. In the 1970s, this was quite a novel concept, but equally, this was the first time a hijacked aircraft had landed on Soviet territory with the hijackers alive. The assault team was made up of volunteer police officers, Mikolai Lakomanov, Valentin Rakov, Alexander Mushkagin, Nikolai Kapustin, and Alexander Ivanovich. Popiradukin, all part of a Ministry of Internal Affairs of the USSR. They all sneaked up on the plane and hid under it, near the front landing gear, under the guise of refueling a fuel tank and blocked the runway, which prevented the aircraft from departing. After several hours on the tarmac, the hijackers were informed that the money was ready to be transferred to them. A transport police officer bought a suitcase, albeit without money, to the hijackers. Believing that the money had been transferred to them, Nikoforov opened the front door to the Yak-40. Immediately, the four officers raided the aircraft. Zayanin began shooting at them, with the police returning fire. Nikoforov was seriously wounded, fell into the airfield and later died in hospital. An armed personnel carrier drove up to the plane and fired a burst of machine gun fire at the plane with 90 bullets hitting the plane. Tear gas was fired into the plane but a smoke bomb lodged between the seats causing the upholstery to catch fire. Passengers panicked and headed to the back of the plane, jumping off along with Bondarev and Zalinin, with Romanov shooting himself and committing suicide. Two passengers were injured in the assault. Zalanin and Bondarev were immediately arrested. Zalanin was sentenced to 10 years in a prison colony, basically a gulag, which was the maximum sentence that he could have received. There he was subjected to constant humiliation and died shortly after his release, however the cause of his death is not known. Bondarev was declared insane and sent to a psychiatric hospital. It is believed that his family paid a bribe for this to happen. Released after six months, he resided in Moscow and died in 2006. On the 19th of December 1973, Popredukin and Kashin received the title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Popredukin graduated from the State Central Order of Lenin Institute of Physical Culture in 1975 and the Academy of the USSR Ministry of Internal Affairs in 1980. He then worked as an inspector of the Personnel Directorate of the Moscow Main Internal Affairs Directorate, a teacher, the deputy head, and the head of Department of Combat and Physical Training at the Academy of the Ministry of Internal affairs of the USSR. However, like many, he deeply struggled after the fall of the USSR in 1991 and his career stalled. He was fired from the police in Russia in 1992. He would state in an interview in 2012 with the newspaper Evening Moscow, which is owned by the government of Moscow, when I was fired I forgot that I was a hero. I hid the star, the hero of the Soviet Union star which was awarded for the aircraft ambushing in the safe. I went into the personnel security for a rich 26-year-old boy. I bought him coffee in bed. I had to start from scratch. He died on the 21st of January 2013, largely forgotten and basically penniless. Kashin is still alive and in 2017 he became an honorary citizen of the city of Bryansk with the Dyatkovos Cadet Aviation Corps named after him. Amazingly, the aircraft was restored and continued to operate for Aeroflot. In 1987, it was transferred to the Ministry of General Engineering and sent to the Central Research Institute of Mechanical Engineering. As a result of a hijacking, passenger screening at Soviet airports was tightened. The hijacking of a plane was made a separate crime with a far harsher sentence, and special units were created to combat terrorism. And as we will see in our next video, it all created a very different outcome for future hijackings within the USSR. Thank you for watching, please do yourself a favour and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of when new videos come out. Also, why not hit that like button and leave a nice comment, it helps more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day and remember the truth is always more interesting than fuction.